Oh, I made a pact with God. And I said, God, things have got to change in my life or I will change my life completely. He said, I waited for about a year and my life did not change one bit. The youth still mocked and ridiculed me. My parents have no time for me. They're always too busy to spend time with me. This is my last recording in my life. Some of the people were tweeting on the YouTube or conversing with him on the YouTube. I don't know how they do that, but some of them were saying <coughs> things like this. Do it, man. Do it. Others were saying, you're a loser, man. You are a loser. In other words of ridicule. He walked around his bedroom, and there on his dresser, he reached down and grabbed a handful of certain objects. He walked over to his camera and held his hand, and there in his hand was a handful of pills. He said, I am going to take these, and I am going to end my life. I'm going to commit suicide. People were saying, do it, man, do it. Others were saying, you're afraid, man, you're afraid, man, do it. No, no, let him alone, he, he's just playing with us anyway. He took the handful of pills and popped them into his mouth, took a glass of water, drank it with much difficulty, finally drank, it swallowed all of the pills and Again, there, were, there were, were snide remarks. Oh, he's just playing with us. He really isn't going to commit suicide. He hasn't had the courage to do that. Do it, man, do it. Several minutes passed, and after a little while, they began to notice those that were watching him on his YouTube video that he was beginning to slur his words a little. And then he said to them that he was going to take a little rest. He was going to lay down. He was tired, and he was going to take a nap on his bed. And he laid down and curled up in a fetal position. Another one said, oh, he's just playing with us. He didn't do it. He, he, he's too much of a loser to do that. And then after a while, someone noticed that he was no longer moving. One individual of all the thousands that were watching this became alarmed and she called her local police. I don't know how they do it, but somehow they were able to ascertain just where this young man was. And there you could see the man, the young boy, lying lifeless on the bed. And then before too long in the little clip, you could hear sirens. And then you heard the ringing of a doorbell. And then the last thing you heard was the voice or the sound of his mother. She opened the door of his bedroom and screamed. You see how important that song is, that Jesus loves me, this I know. For the Bible tells me so. But the question arises is who, who must give an account to who? He said that he had made a pact with God and that if God didn't change his life, well, he was going to end it. Who must give an account to who? Must, is God accountable to us? Or is God, or are we accountable to God? Whose way is right? Well, long ago, the psalmist, and repeatedly in the Bible, God proclaims this war, word of warning for it. There is a way that seems right unto man, but the end thereof is the way of death. 
The Bible repeatedly states that there is a way that seems right unto man, but the end thereof is the way of death. The world would have us to believe that it is the way we should live. We should follow the world. The world tells us that God really isn't all that concerned about our sins. Indeed, they may even say that God doesn't even see our sins, much less be concerned about them. But God says the wages of sin is always death. It's always death. The world is lying to us when it tells us it doesn't matter whether or not we sin. Because God pronounced that judgment upon Adam and Eve. The day you eat of that fruit, you shall surely die. Paul mentions a couple sins in our epistle lesson. One of them is selfish ambition. Someone who always wants to get his way. Someone who doesn't care about how other people feel about his actions. Have, have not your own feelings been hurt in your life as you were growing up because someone didn't, wasn't concerned a bit how you feel, felt. They just wanted what their way. And they didn't mind who they were tramping over on the process. Sadly say, this, this kind of selfish ambition also seeps into the church too. There are some in the church who always want it their way. They've got an agenda and they don't care what the rest of the members think. They aren't worried about the, other, the rest of the body of the church. They simply want to carry out their agenda. Sadly, many times it's true, and I want to publicly repent and apologize if it's true for me, as far as you're concerned. It's sad to say, many ministers are that way. Many ministers are that way. They, they, they want their own way, don't they? I remember when I was growing up, we had a minister who wanted his own way. And was mad if he didn't get it. That's a sin. Selfish ambition. Paul mentions it as a, as a sin that we, they aren't concerned about their other brothers and sisters in the church and how it upsets them and how it makes them feel. Or if they trample to death the, the, the faith of a, of a weak Christian in the process. Paul also says... Conceit. conceit, conceit, or thinking that some, someone thinks that they're better than the rest of the people, better than the rest of the people. We see this too, and God forbid that that's in us, but it's a sin where we look down on certain people Maybe because of the color of their skin. Maybe because of their, of their family that they, they, come, they, they come from. Maybe because of their sinful actions that they had committed as they were going through life, coming, growing up. And we begin to think that we're better than them. We can look down on them. We can treat them with contempt. And in a sense, sad to say, you're guilty of this. Every one of you. And so am I. And we call it one word. Gossip. Gossip. You and I do not gossip about people because we want to help them, do we? If we really wanted to help them, we would go and talk to them. And we would offer our aid to them. No, we're not interested in helping those people. 
Ultimately, we're only interested in making ourselves look good at their expense. It's a sin. There is a way that seemeth right in the man, but the end thereof is the ways of death. Sin will be our downfall. Sin produces or brings forth God's wrath. God was not joking when he told Adam and Eve, you eat of that fruit and you're going to die. He warned them ahead of time. And yet Satan convinced them that if they would only do what he says, then they would find joy and happiness. Satan was lying to them. He always lies. He's lying to you and to me when he tempts us into sinning. He lies for a living. And he didn't, doesn't care whose life he destroys in the, po- in, the, in the process. He gets us to commit sins that we later on in life we wish we never committed. I know that's true in my life. My sister still never lets me forget that I didn't live the best of life for a while when I wasn't a Christian. Who do you think you are, Ray? The Pope? But God calls us to life. God calls us to life. Heaven is filled with people who once lived sinful lives. Some of the worst sinners walking on earth are now in heaven. Adam and Eve brought all of this upon us, and they're in heaven. Moses was a a murderer. He slew, he killed, he murdered that, that Egyptian. Paul was a blasphemer. Peter was a denier of Christ. The list goes on and on. Heaven is filled with people who were sinful in this life. They listened to the devil, the world, and their sinful flesh, and instead of finding joy and happiness and life, they found death and the wrath of God. God does not not want us to do that. And he says already in Ezekiel, Why will you die, O house of Israel? When our kids were growing up, and I'm sure this was true of me too, thankfully my mother never remembers those times in my life, we would see our kids do something that that we knew was not only, it was just going to bring them misery. But they couldn't see that, and so they went ahead and did it anyway. God sees for us that sin that we take all too lightly so often, sin does not bring us the joy and the peace and the happiness we're looking for. Look at that poor kid in that video. He was truly, in the end, his own worst enemy. I take no pleasure in the death of the wicked. It isn't that God isn't sinful like you and, you and I are. There are times, isn't it, when, when somebody's done us harm or we've experienced some, some grief at somebody else's head, we kind of take a, a secret satisfaction when we see them suffer some way. Like, ah, they deserve that and finally they get what they deserve. God isn't that way. He doesn't take pleasure in anybody's eternal damnation. He created everybody. They're all his people. He doesn't want any to perish, but that all would come to the knowledge of the truth. God is greed when he sees so many people ending up in hell. Turn ye, turn ye, O house of Israel, and live. God offers us life. He offers us eternal life. 
And this is eternal life, that you believe in Jesus Christ as your Savior. Christ has done it all. He became true man in his state of humiliation. He submitted himself to all the... You think you know about ridicule and hatred and ill treatment of people's hands. Christ experienced far more, didn't he? Blaspheming, ridicule by the religious leaders, always thinking evil and plotting evil against him. Even his own brothers and sisters, his own family ultimately turned against him. They didn't believe either and said that he was insane. He experienced it all for you and for me. God made him who knew no sin to be sin for us. Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. He came to seek and to save us. That's why sinners gather around Christ. That's why you and I gather around Christ. We're sinners and we know that he alone has the cure for sin. He paid for our sins in full and not only ours, but for the sins of the whole world. And he truly Truly, his blood covers all of our sins. So much so that there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. When God forgives us, as he does, did for us on the cross, then he forgives us our sins and he forgets them. He no longer holds it against us. This is the comfort that you and I have. And you think about all those who came. They came because he gave them something nobody else could do. Forgiveness. He gave them unconditional love. That's what that boy in that video really needed, wasn't it? He needed to know that someone loved him. And our children taught us who that was. Jesus loves me. This I know, for the Bible tells me so. It's as simple as that, isn't it? Let Christ's way then be your way. Christ unites us. Christ unites us. He is the one, he sends his spirit to dwell in us. He brings us to faith and then he keeps us in the faith. He works everything out for the good of his children. You have his promise in the midst of all of your struggles of life, all of your pain, all of your suffering. God will work all of that out for the good of those who love him. Now is the time then to, to let Christ's way be your way. Let Christ, who is, I am the life, be your life. Let Christ, who says, I am the, the truth, be your truth. Let Christ, who says, I am the resurrection in life, be your resurrection in life. Let his word guide and govern your life. And as you do, People will notice. People will notice that you're not living as the world would have you to live, but you're living as God wants you to live. And his way is always right. We as a church, the more we as a church allow God's word to guide and govern our lives the more our community will see that we are whom we claim to be God's children, that God is at work and, and that he's alive in our midst. It's, it's through his word and sacrament that God calls and gathers his children around Christ the crucified. Back in 1743, Handel's great Great work. The Messiah was first played and the king 
was gathered there as one of the attendees. And when it came to that, that great chorus, he is king of kings and lord of lords. And the choirs were singing with, with harmony with the, and it kept get crescendo of louder and louder. Finally, the king stood up. And everybody stood up with him. It was as if they were saying what Paul said in our epistle. God has given him a name which is above every name. That at the name of Jesus every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess under the heavens and under the earth that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Amen. And now may the peace of God which surpasses all understanding keep your hearts and minds in true faith unto life everlasting. Amen. pray, O Lord, Heavenly Father, we are your children. You have called us by your mercy and compassion. You've forgiven us of our sins. And as your children, we know that your way is always right. And so we pray, may we make your wisdom our wisdom, your life our life, and your wisdom our wisdom, your truth our truth. And that we as your children may ever reflect your love and forgiveness in our lives that we truly, that we may bear much fruit, good fruit in serving you. And Heavenly Father, we pray for those who are sick, 
Uh, those are their beds of illness, those recovering from surgery. Remember, especially in our prayers, uh, Luda Wallace and Ned Pennell and Richard Sumter and Cindy Herman. Be with them and sustain them and strengthen them with the assurance of your love for them, that you came to be their Savior and you've promised to work everything out for their good. And we ask your blessing upon Salem. Grant uh, the members of Salem wisdom and understanding as they will be voting next week on whether or not to proceed with the uh, building the committee's recommendation. Uh, we pray that uh, your will might be done and that it may all be done to your glory and honor, whichever decision is made, that we as a congregation may go forward with confidence and with the assurance and the unity that you have so richly blessed us with. And so we ask your blessing upon us, grant us wisdom and understanding. <laughs> and we pray for the men and women of armed forces, especially those in harm's way. And we pray for the leaders of our, of our, of our countries around the world. Uh, grant them wisdom uh, to uh, be faithful leaders, to enact fair and just laws. And we pray that you would raise up a multitude of faithful Christian men and women to serve uh, our country in various positions. For we ask this in our Savior's blessed name. Amen. These whatsoever things you would have us to ask of thee, O God, grant unto us for the sake of the bitter suffering and death of Jesus Christ, your only Son, our Lord and Savior, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Ghost, ever one God, world without end. Amen. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks unto the Lord our God. It is truly meet, right, and salutary that we should at all times and all places give thanks unto thee, O Lord, Holy Father, Almighty, everlasting God, who with thine only begotten Son and the Holy Ghost art one God, one Lord. And in the confession of the only true God, we worship the Trinity in person, the unity in substance, of majesty co-equal. Therefore, with angels and archangels, all the company of heaven, we laud and magnify your glorious name, evermore praising you and saying, Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. 